On today's show, Laura Haywood interviews the badass star of Bad Out of Hell, the musical, Christina Bennington. Welcome to Laura Haywood Interviews. I'm Laura Haywood. This weekend, my mind was blown at New York City Center with the larger-than-life, post-apocalyptic, hard rock musical, That Out of Hell. I thought this was a Meatloaf musical, since Meatloaf was the singer who released the Bad Out of Hell album in 1977, but in my research, I learned that Bad Out of Hell was actually supposed to be a musical first, written by the legendary songwriter and producer Jim Steinman, and it was recorded as kind of a concept album that took off, becoming a hit in its own right. The script of Bad Out of Hell, the musical, is inspired by Peter Pan, and Jim Steinman actually started writing it as a college student in the 1960s. This has been the project of his lifetime, and finally it's found a home on the New York stage at New York City Center. In addition to the songs that Meatloaf made popular, like All Revved Up With No Place To Go, Two Out Of Three Ain't Bad, and I Would Do Anything For Love, But I Won't Do That, and the title track, Bad Out Of Hell, the musical also features Steinman Penn's smash hits made famous by artists as diverse as Bette Midler, Celine Dion, and Air Supply. Now my guest today, Christina Benning, slays the role of Raven, the show's young ingenue, whose father is a tyrant ruling over a post-apocalyptic city called Obsidian, formerly known as New York. She's deeply in love with the forbidden heartthrob Strat, made forever young by an event called the Chemical Wars that froze him and his gang as eternal 18-year-olds. Raven, not frozen, has just turned 18 and longs for the freedom represented by Strat and his gang, The Lost. You might say she is the Wendy in this Peter Pan story, with Strat as the sexy motorcycle riding Peter. The one thing they have in common is that they can both seriously rock. Christina originated the role at the Manchester Opera House prior to the London run of Bad Out of Hell, played the role in Ontario, and is now here in her first professional gig in New York City. And she's in studio with me today. Welcome Christina Bennington to Laura Haywood Interviews. Thank you so much for having me. I am beyond thrilled to be here. And now, do you mean in New York City? Do you mean at New York City Center doing Bad Out of Hell, or do you mean here with me? I mean here with you <laughs> oh, right okay. now, but all of the above are pretty surreal. So you are currently, we're recording, we're, we're, we're live on Laura Haywood interviews yeah. for people listening live, um, a few days into previews. Um, the podcast version will be out free for everybody right after you have your opening night. Yes. But when we're sitting here in studio, you're in previews. Um, so you've had five or six days of performances so far, right? Yeah, it's been completely wild. <laughs> you've been playing this role for three years. Is being in New York wilder than it has been in other cities? Yeah, it's been a very different process, and each version of this show really is very different than the last. Mm -hmm. And again, this is like a whole new iteration, a whole new cast for me, a different set. You know, there's been a lot of script changes, um, and a lot of that is for the demographic. You know, the audience wants different things here than they might have in London. Interesting. And so the show is constantly evolving. So for me, it's a real process of learning what lands with this audience as mm -hmm. well. Um, and the first couple of previews, that's been really interesting because I think things that I've done for two or three years now in this role are suddenly funny here. Oh, like what? Like I, I roll around a lot, you might have noticed. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, you, it's a I, very acrobatic It's a role. very acrobatic performance. I Kind of near the beginning, um, I just, I don't know, I thought it would be really fun to make Raven an extreme, like have this really extreme physical life uh -huh. because she's, you know, grown up kind of locked away from everyone. She doesn't really have many points of reference um, on who to be like and she's watched The Lost from the street and I thought, well, why don't I just make a fun choice that's mm -hmm. in this kind of post-apocalyptic world? Why can't her movement be really strange? Well, it's very it's very expressionistic, you know? And yeah. I studied theater back in the day when I was in college. And, you know, expressionistic theater is all about using the stage as a platform to uh, perform our inner monologues and our, and our inner angst yeah. on the outside. Yeah. And so I totally read that as... You know, she's literally bursting at the seams, as we all are at 18. Yeah. You know, you're like, are you an adult? Are you grown up? Your frontal lobe isn't completely formed, but you also, <laughs> like, you're, you, you know, you're not a kid anymore. Yeah. And she and you, in your rolling around, showed me, like, I got to get out of here, and I, like, I, I want to even get out of my own skin sometimes. Yeah, and Jay and I, the director the very first entrance I make into that family scene where we set up kind of the family dynamic he was like okay yeah so you're just gonna 
we're just going to walk at the sofa as if it's not there and just continue rolling over it. <laughs> so, I, you know, the first thing I do is launch myself over a sofa and just carry on rolling down the stage as if it was as normal as walking into a room. And that was just always taken as something I did before. And all of a sudden, it's the funniest thing ever. I mean, it. I don't know how it could not be funny. It's so it looks weird to like me. A, it looks like a Marx Brothers thing, <laughs> yeah. you know? And it's so funny. Things like that are just... You know, and other jokes that might have been really funny in the UK aren't as funny here. So, like, every night in previews, we've been changing things again and again. And it's really nice to see we've had a lot of super fans come over from the UK. And they've really got on board with a lot of the changes and oh, embraced things. Because it's hard when you love something so much and it's so precious to you. Um, you know, you can be a bit defensive of it. And, you know, same with a lot of us original cast members who are like, but we did it this way mm -hmm. before. And um, what means a lot is when the fans you know, are really supportive of those changes and want to, like, help grow the show and enjoy its life here. Yeah, that is really wonderful. The fans of both the show and of the Meatloaf album have been very vocal about their support <laughs> for this show. In fact, I heard there was a little bit of, like, a traffic jam that happened because there was a motorcycle parade of Meatloaf yeah. fans that came to the first preview. I heard this. I was, I was backstage getting ready, so I didn't see it. But we've actually, at every opening so far, we've had, like, a fleet of Harleys. So, uh, is that by design or is it like just? I think a originally natural thing? back in Manchester, someone said to all these people like, "Hey, you know, we, we want to create a bit of buzz. Like, do you want to come and just like hang out and like you can come see the show and just like ride around? Great, great, great." And kind of thinking maybe someone, you know, someone will do it, whatever. And then so many people turned up that it just <laughs> then became a thing, like a rally. Yeah, and it's it's like um almost like a chorus, like a choir of Harleys, oh, like greeting the opening night and the noises were just insane. So I'm not surprised that that happened mm -hmm. for first preview, if that makes sense. Um well, hopefully Hopefully it won't just be the people who already know the show and who already know the album, but the New York theater audience as well. Yeah. I love the story that this is a musical that's been dreamt of and in development for 40 years. It's kind of crazy. And it's kind of weird when you think when someone has had 40 years to gestate mm -hmm. something like that, the amount of versions that it's gone through, not just in Jim's head, but that have been tried out and workshopped and... Actually, the thing I'm most grateful about is this is such a life-changing opportunity for me. And if it had happened five years ago or in five years' time, mm -hmm. in that 40-year gestation, it wouldn't have been me. Right. So it's, it's really odd to think, wow, I, I'm so lucky to be in the right place at the right time and to be the thing that Jim kind of envisioned. And Jim always says that he feels like Andrew and I, he, like, created us. Andrew's the guy who plays Strat. Yes, Andrew who plays Strat. Um, and he says that he almost feels like we're his children. Like he, he dreamt us and, and we were like brought to life at well, the exact time it came together. You before you were born. Right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know exactly how old you are, but I know you're not 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would yeah be a very interesting I mean, interpretation even, of the show. <laughs> he may have even dreamed Lena Hall. Exactly. Because yeah, I don't yeah. think she's 40 yet either. Yeah. And no, the fact she's that not. she's playing your mom is a bit of a stretch, just age-wise. Right? Well, actually, um, if, if you take it, like, they sing Paradise by the Dashboard Light, which, I mean, you have to come see Lena and Bradley do that. It's just... It's one of those things that you hear in a production meeting and you think, really, that's the way they're going to stage that? There's no way that's going to happen. This is the number on the car? Yeah. Uh -huh. And you go, really? But it's in the birthday party. Like, how will that work? Right. How will that happen? But everyone just goes, yes. And then I actually found out Lena was playing my mom on the cast announcement day. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, it was announced and I was like, oh my, What? And then I still feel like she can play 22. I know, right? So and I said that to her. I was like, I was like, you look like my big sister, but thank gosh you're taller than me, you know? Um, so that helps. She pulls it off. She's yeah. got the acting chops. Yeah. Right? And she absolutely has the... What did I just do? <laughs> oh, I pressed a button. Oh. Um, this is my favorite thing Dance about doing dancing. the show live is yeah. that... Um, is that it doesn't pretend to be perfect. Yeah, it and just... I had a great dance routine there. Wish you all could have seen <laughs> oh, it. Oh, no! People pay big money to see you dance. <laughs> right? uh, I'm sorry about the distraction. That's fine. Um, but yeah, so it was really exciting for me to learn that I was working with Lena. But when they sing Paradise, they're talking about essentially Raven's conception. Right. When they were barely it's 17. It's a very sexy scene. It is. It's a very oh, sexy show, they but they're barely, barely 17, 17 and barely dressed. So actually, she is pretty much exactly the right age to play Raven's mom. Right. Yeah. And it is a story about people who are forever young. And there's some who are 
who were frozen that way. And then yeah. there's some who are just that way in their soul and their spirit. And Lena's character definitely is, she's sort of, for survival reasons, bought into the parenting thing and living in the tower, protected from the, exactly that. the, the chemical wars, which are never really explained, but it gives you a lot of room to imagine. And, um, and but she has this secret past that also we sort of have to conjure up in our minds that shows us that she is in fact forever young too and has a connection to this, the, like the lost children. I feel like mm-hmm. maybe she has, um, I don't know how she managed to not get frozen, but I feel like maybe she knew them before. Yeah, and a lot of people think that. And I guess what's so great is we leave that open to interpretation and there are hints here and there, but what's so wonderful about like Raven and Sloane's relationship and I guess the struggle. Sloane is the mom's name? Yes. I just thought she was the mom. <laughs> Sloane. It is it's said a couple of times but quite quickly. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the thing that I love about their relationship is that the more Raven learns about Sloane, the more she's like, hey, but you're, you're like me. You want the same things as me. Why aren't you helping me out? And then so the more she does and they kind of start to grow closer when Raven's hitting this 18 age because Sloane's kind of realizing wow, we are similar, but it could be different for you. You could, you know, follow your wild side and be a bit reckless and not live the perfect kind of, or not so perfect, Stepford mom kind of thing, like, and struggle in that life in a, you know, a tower where there are live cameras in your house the whole time. <laughs> yeah, so that, that we should talk about the set, actually, because it is huge. I mean, see, anybody who's gone to a city center, city center encores, <laughs> production that is a term that I always have trouble saying city senti- <laughs> see I couldn't even do it when I was trying to okay I'm saying it one more time anyone who has been to a city center on course production has seen uh, that shows can be really scaled down and intimate there but there's nothing like that out of hell that I've ever seen there that really shows how soaring the space is and because it is so wide and deep there are seats on the sides where it would have been perhaps a restricted view, but there's use of screens and cameras built into the, the choreography of the show so that even if you can't see something happening way off to the side, you can see it on a screen uh, projected, sometimes even onto the set, mm-hmm. in a way that really brings to light this um, Jim Steinman music video feel. Yes, exactly that. and. It's one of those things that Jay is quite known for in his work. He directs a lot of opera and uses a lot of live camera work. And I, um, I think he said to me before, it it makes theater feel even more live because you can choose your own perspective. And a lot of us these days are so used to watching so many things on screen, like, mm-hmm. you know, and binge watching. And we expect to be able to have that connection with people. So what's so wonderful is you can watch this show and you can look at the outside from the front perspective or you can choose to watch the very up close reactions Mm -hmm. in a lot of scenes, um, which I think is like quite a weird thing and a challenge as an actor as well to be able to play to to both kind of mediums at the same time. Yeah, because if you're playing to the the back row in a house that big, how can you have the subtlety that you need to get to yeah. express it to the camera, which is two feet from you. And it, that, that it really is one of the biggest challenges, especially in Raven's role, because there's a lot of times I'm running from the scene upstairs on camera down to the main stage and throwing myself around, like, up and down, up and down. So there's a lot of quick switches. But I think the, the coolest thing for me about the camera work is when it's in Falco Tower, it's almost like a play on our kind of Kardashian reality TV culture. It's like we will broadcast anything and social media to a certain extent totally we will broadcast absolutely anything about our lives including the the ugly things Mm -hmm. you know it kind of doesn't matter and i think that in a way it it is a comment in itself that we're broadcasting these scenes of extreme family dysfunction in a really close-up way for people to see on stage which feels more real than a tv show because you're watching it there there is also some like it's not quite nudity, but there are some pretty, like, surprisingly um, revealing outfit choices. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to, I want, this is something I liked about the show. It's mm-hmm. going to sound like a weird thing to say, but there were parts of it that reminded me of, like, softcore porn <laughs> in that, and not just because of, like, the very tight pair of sparkly pink underwear yeah. that Bradley Dean is wearing <laughs> in that right after that car scene. But because it's like, what matters is the spectacle. Yeah. And 
there are these, pardon the expression, explosive moments throughout the show, and that's why you go. Yeah. It's like, it, it doesn't really matter that you don't know what the, when the Chemical Wars is, and it doesn't <laughs> really matter that you don't know what Lena Hall's, like, backstory is as yeah. the mom, you know, and... And the, it's like it has the same amount of storytelling as a really fantastic 70s uh, music video yeah. and like a Cinemax um, porn story that you're not really <laughs> watching for the story anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like it's we want it to be like a rock concert explosive experience. And I, you know, the like chemical wars and the setup of everything, a lot of that comes from over 40 years. Mm -hmm. People deciding what would be you know, it's the kind of like a lot of people putting input into Jim's story of, you know, why this happened to these kids. Like, why are these kids 18 for forever? And um, really, if you look at the story of Peter Pan, you know, you don't really know. Mm -mm. It's an accepted fact in that universe. So when we talk about the chemical wars and we talk about the different things, Lena as Sloan presents that to Raven as a scary horror story, as mm -hmm. a bedtime story. So it's really up to you if you decide she's telling Raven the truth or not. Or if it is just an accepted fact in that universe that isn't that no you know that no one can really explain. So you make up your own solution. It's right. like there are so many things that if you watched a day in the life of me, I wouldn't explain the backstory of you know of the city or whatever. You just right. it, that's just the way it is. That is where it is set, and that is what it is. Um, but I think there is something about watching a show that people want to go. But why? Because you want to you want to have the knowledge of it. Um, but you know it's it's like Peter Pan. It's you know that's just the way this yeah nobody ever asks why there. You know, well, alternate universe is, right. and uh, you know, and that's part of the fun of it because you're never quite sure. Um, and I won't tell you what I think because I think it's more fun to leave it up to everyone. You're never, you're never quite sure. You know, when is that point where it, you know could Raven freeze as well? Is she gonna freeze? And you know, like we hint to that now with the you know the way the show is opening mm -hmm. at the moment, and. Um, so as well, it's like, is it the chemical wars or is it just a thing? It's, is it a decision that you make? You know, we all have our own view on how this universe works. And is it a decision that Sloan didn't make? And, you know, that kind of a thing. Right. And would she have made it if she hadn't gotten pregnant at exactly. 17 before she was eligible, if that's the right word? Yeah, exactly. Oh, so. Now I'm going to have to come see it again <laughs> and watch it with that in mind. Uh, I think it's really it's a really astute point when you say that we don't go around giving our entire life's exposition that there are things about our lives that we just understand about each other. Yeah, it's like Raven's physical life. I don't explain why she's like that. She just is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that I found really interesting, uh, which is super meta, <laughs> is that you have been playing this role, this 18 year old for three years. Yes. You have essentially been frozen at 18. <laughs> yes. And I'm wondering whether that, whether, whether Jim's vision, and you may or may not know the answer to this, s sort of had that, re that theatrical reference in mind. Like I know when, did you, did you see Groundhog Day, the musical? I didn't by see any it chance? when it was in London. No. Oh my gosh, it was one of my favorites. It was only in New York for seven weeks and yeah. I saw it seven times. Wow. Um, but uh, it, one of the things that it did was it, it, was a, it made a reference theatrically to the idea that when you're doing a show, mm -hmm. you do the same thing every day over and over and over. And there are little moments where you can choose to make different choices, but you're stuck in the same story again yeah. and again and again. And I, maybe this is more a question for the characters, or I mean the actors who are playing the freezers as they yeah, call them the, the forever 18s yeah. the lost but i just feel like there is some re like meta reference to what it means to be an actor playing a role who never ages yeah totally and andrew and i actually jay was talking to us the other day the director and he said i was just looking back at some photos from the very first rehearsal process the first press showing and he was like you look like babies mm -hmm. I mean you look the same but you look like babies and it's so funny because I think you kind of forget about physical aging mm -hmm. when it comes to this kind of a show and what you actually start thinking about is how you age you know maturity wise mm. because you know I'm still playing this character who's turning 18 I'm actually celebrating my 18th birthday every right. night on stage you know sometimes twice a day and you go wow, I, 
you know, I'm still wearing the same costume, essentially. I'm still, you know, I've got the same wig. I still essentially look the same mm -hmm. as I did kind of two years ago. But the way I approach everything has changed so much outside of the show and in my life. So, of course, that's going to have a bearing on what you do. Um, and it is really helpful to check in every so often with, you know, we're lucky that so much of the way we played Raven and Strat has been documented mm -hmm. because you cannot replicate without actively thinking about it the true energy of not really knowing each other. Mm, yeah. So you go back and you think, you watch those first rehearsal videos and you think back to Manchester and you think, wow, Raven and Strat first meeting was also Andrew and I first meeting. Wow, yeah, that must have been electric. Yeah, and you and like obviously we found it very exciting and, you know, easy to work together and all those kind of things. But every so often you have to check back in as a cast, as an actor, and really as a human and think I need to be grateful to re-experience that feeling all the time. So I think that's the the thing that changes is is the need to like like actively freshen everything again because so much of it happens organically around you like the lines are always changing songs have been cut songs have been added mm -hmm. the set for me is completely different than in london my muscle memory is not doing me well right now yeah. because i have so many specific ways that i would climb up the tunnel but all the handholds have changed and oh all the steps gosh. have changed so i'm like just throwing myself flat with this tunnel and like crashing constantly um, I, I hope that you're taking care of yourself. <laughs> I'm trying. Like wearing <laughs> knee pads if necessary. Well, or... you joke. I, people can't see this, but you can see my knees. <laughs> oh, they're so bruised. <laughs> they're just covered. Are you gonna, uh, this is, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to phrase it as a question. I'm going to say, I really hope you're getting hazard pay. <laughs> yes. That's, we, a, that's a union thing. That is definitely needed on this set. Um, but So all those things change. And actually, again, people can't see this, but I'll put a photo on Instagram. Um, the dress I'm wearing today was the original Raven wedding dress. Uh -huh. And I just That is? Yeah. I used to wear this in the wedding scene back in Manchester. So we also had full costume redesigns. Like everything has changed. Yeah, now it in looks like way. a wedding dress. What you're wearing today is like just a cute yeah. summer outfit. Yeah. And it's it's so funny. It's like so all of those things have changed around me, but yet the real thing I think that you need to focus on that changes is your perspective. Because mm -hmm. also I was coming into this just like you know, just couldn't even believe I got the job. So I wasn't feeling very confident as an actor. You know, you're kind of just going, oh gosh, I can't believe someone's letting me do this. Someone's letting me create a role in this crazy thing that's been waiting around for 40 years. And they found Andrew and I and gone, you're perfect. Now's the moment. Yeah, this is the time. Have a good time. Well, especially when you've been playing these, like you're a classically trained soprano. You're yeah. like an operatic soprano. And I would not, not guess that for somebody who was you know, making their New York stage debut in a like rock and roll sort of scream musical. Yeah. I mean, it's not screaming. It's like, yeah. but it is hard rock. Yeah. And you are screlting. Yeah. And what's really fun for me is like, I was given so much license to do what I wanted, like by Meatloaf and Jim themselves. Mm -hmm. Meatloaf said, you know, obviously you're, you're not going to sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> He was that would like, be an interesting right? choice. He said, your interpretation is going to be just as valid, if not more so now. These songs are yours. You guys need to take them and make them your own. And Jim, one of his favorite things is when people want to sing higher. So I I now realize this is probably one of the reasons I got the part, is um, I came in and I was doing All Coming Back to Me. Um, of course, which is you like know, a Celine Dion yeah, song. Yeah, most famously and Celine. Who um, knew <laughs> that like that was written by the same guy who wrote Bad Out of yeah, Hell? Yeah, it's crazy. And I was doing this for my audition, and they were like, "How does it feel in your voice?" In my recall, and I said, "It's a bit low," um, because as a classical soprano, you tend to want to belt higher. So actually, the hardest part of your range is the kind of lower mid belt mm -hmm. because it's just not exercised as much. So I was like, mm, it "Could be higher." So we took it up, and then I was like, mm, could still be a little higher. It would just be more comfortable for me. And apparently, they were all really shocked. I didn't know. I would, they all did not act shocked in the room. So they would make me sing it, like, many, many times in a row, and then I'd get invited back the next day to check if I could still sing it. Oh, so that you hadn't, like, destroyed your yeah, voice exactly. by doing it once. That's smart. So then when I went into the rehearsal process, Heaven Can Wait, for example, was, like, a third lower maybe more actually now um and it was going to be a lullaby and i was going to be like half asleep singing it and i was like how about we put a key change in and do it more like this ellen foley version that was done and um and andrew actually always says that 
he he was one of the first people who suggested it. We had a music call together, and he was like, "You should take a hire for her. You should take a hire." And I was like, "I'm not arguing." So Jim was like, "Yes, fantastic." So all the Raven stuff, because I made it as a classical soprano, mm -hmm. now has some like little hints of soprano in it, and it's a lot higher than it would have been if someone else had landed that role. And God help the person who takes that <laughs> role on next. Although I mean, that's what happened with Phantom of the Opera. You know, and Sarah Brightman, as it was written for her, for her yeah. voice. And it's like, there aren't that many people who have that kind of voice. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I feel like it's, but that's what happens when you yeah. originate a role. It, it You imprint on it forever. And it's weird because whenever I first started singing, it's all coming back to me now. I was thinking, oh gosh, everyone's going to be comparing me to Celine. And it's really stressful. And now... Apparently, I know quite a lot of music directors in the UK, and they're saying people are bringing it into audition rooms and singing it like you on the album. They're not singing it like Celine. You know, they're singing like the Battle of Hellcast album, and right. people are bringing in Heaven Can Wait, and, you know, they're doing like the little licks and stuff that you would do. Mm -hmm. And that is the weirdest thing in the world <laughs> to me. Like, I do not understand that people who then audition for Cover Raven and Raven in other countries and stuff, they're listening. And, you know, some of the US girls that I've met here have said, when they were auditioning for cover Raven and stuff, you know, they'd be listening to me on the album. And it, I'm like, I, that just blows my mind. It's so odd to me that I'm like, oh, of course, because I've made it and shaped it, that I am now the point of reference for the character. Oh my gosh. Weird. You, you are literally frozen in yeah. time on the album. It's so weird. And even I listen back to You're the album. You're a freezer. I am, I'm a <laughs> literal freezer. And people come up to me sometimes at stage door and they go, you don't sing that like you do on the album anymore. And I'm like, that was like three years ago. Mm -hmm. It's just, diff you know, it's different. And I sing it, I sing the show different most nights, to be honest. Some nights it's like cleaner, more angelic. Some nights it's a lot growlier. It just kind of depends. And we're given quite a lot of freedom in that way. That like gets just like how you feel because it's, you know, paired so much. This, this show is about the music, in my opinion. And each song is like a scene in itself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is like the emotion you're feeling in the scene that day will just lend itself to how you sing it that day. Yeah. And it should, I feel like it should be yeah. that way. And certainly, you know, I've been, I tend to get obsessed about stuff. That's my jam is like, I'm a professional enthusiast because yeah. I just, my enthusiasm from the time I was a little girl about whatever the topic was would be turned up to 11 or 15 or 111. Yeah. Um, but so there have been uh, music acts that I've followed on tour. Oh, and even if they were doing the same set list every night, the songs were never the same. Yeah. And comparing those, you know, oh my gosh, now it's an acoustic song tonight, yeah. even though it's in the same spot as in a set list. And, you know, or, or you could see even like the projection designer, the lighting doing different things mm -hmm. because that person has a voice that they get to show their creativity off a little bit instead of just pressing a button and saying go. Yeah. Um, and so I can imagine that this is the kind of production that seeing it twice would be more than double the experience of seeing it once. Definitely. Because um, you have the comparisons to make. We have people who've seen it hundreds of times. In London, we had people who came every night. You know, there's, because there's just so much to watch because of the camera work, because so much of the ensemble work also is about individual personality, which um, I suppose mainly differs from like uh, sort of more period musicals, which again is more my my world, mm -hmm. the legit period musical, um, where you kind of get, and then the ensemble are there. You know, all of our ensemble characters have names. They all have relationships within the ensemble. Um, we're very much about like promoting their lives as well. So people will be fans of specific members, members of the ensemble and specific um, characters. Yeah. And they'll say like, oh, who's playing Odessa Suite in this version? Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's- Or who is Tink? Yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a whole kind of other world and our fans are, easily like supportive and we're so grateful to have had so many people fly over from the UK and come from Canada and Manchester and even to these first couple previews mm -hmm. and we're expecting more on opening night so I understand that audiences at stage doors are really different over here than over there do you even have a stage door culture on yeah, the West End and, and in London Bad Out of Hell our stage door culture was massive really yeah massive it's like a big family um, not so much in Toronto whenever we were there because a lot of people didn't know they could, could stage door. Mm -hmm. So they would meet fans from the UK who would say, come with us to the stage door. And they were like, wow, we didn't know we could just come meet you. How great. <laughs> um, here it's been, it, so far it's been, we've seen a lot of people that we kind of mostly know already. So I think it'll, you know, it'll, it'll get more interesting as it goes on um, when people kind of realize that it is a thing at city center. Cause I think maybe it 
it isn't so much usually. Like, where I've seen some, like, crazy wild Broadway stage doors. Oh, my gosh, I know. It usually depends on who the cast is and how well-known they are. Yeah. Um, it, would not, it would not surprise me if by the end of your run you have people who have fallen in love and come back over yeah. and over. And once they feel like they know you, they want that personal connection. Of course, and we love that. It's yeah. so much fun. I'm, I wonder if your run is long enough to, like, yeah. for people to have that. Because this crazy stage doors tend to be for shows like – Dear Evan Hansen and mm -hmm. you know and Hamilton but but also for shorter run shows like Be More Chill that yeah. people know from the cast album yeah so but it's and nice I walk to past know. Hades Town all the time oh, and it's oh always like crazy it's, yeah I know Eva from the UK like yeah she's... that's right did you guys ever work together no we've never worked together but I, I like I've met her uh -huh. many times yeah so let's let's help people get to know you a little more for pre Bat Out of Hell yes you're from Northern Ireland yes um and how did you start performing? How old were you when you realized that you had the talent and the bug? Well, I always say that I started performing when I was probably eight or nine, and I was entered into like school singing competitions. But I like talent since, shows. Yeah, like um, it's sort of like uh, we used to do this. Uh, this is a really weird cultural thing, and I look back on it and I think, why would anyone subject children to this? <laughs> um, and my mom always says it was like the most stressful experience of her whole life, where you go in an age group and it's a, like a full Northern Ireland music festival competition and each school submits like two people per age group or something um, and you go and there's like 35 kids in each little age group class and you all sing the same song one after another so there's a set song and everyone gets up and sings the same song and all, a lot of the parents are like crazy competitive and my mom hated it so much and she used to say it made her feel sick um, and and then they stand up and they make comments about you all. And I was like eight. And I think, <sighs> gosh, that's really horrible. Because, you know, you're literally comparing word for word yourself with every single other kid. So I used to do these music festivals. Uh, luckily, I've got quite a, um, a strong, you know, uh, exterior and backbone. So I was like, yeah, I'm fine. It's fine. I'm just going to win them. Because um, <laughs> I was very a very competitive child. Still, I'm very competitive. Um, so I did those. But I've since seen some like home videos where I'm very much over dramatic, and apparently it's just always been very obvious that I was going to do it. You were always playing to the back row, even when there Absolutely. was no back row. Absolutely, like sunglasses, giving it my best, dancing life, like from the age of two. So apparently it was very obvious. But I got very seriously into choirs when I was in my secondary school in Northern Ireland, and was very. Um, in very highly competitive choirs. I had choir at school like 10 times a week. Whoa. In a five day, yeah. you know, school week. I would have it like before school, lunchtime, after school, um, which really made me an excellent sight singer, mm -hmm. which is really, really valuable in musical theater because not a lot of people can do that. Um, That's where the skill comes. Yeah. You know, and I think so many people think about uh, performers role as being developing their talent and or you know being born with their talent yeah but nobody's born knowing how to sight read yeah music and I was really lucky to be kind of forced into that because it's scary mm -hmm. um just every day to it's a muscle you have to like flex it and grow it like anything else like probably now I would be not as well practiced because it's been a while since I've had to do it a lot but um it's really a valuable thing so I got into like serious choral things and then I did a BBC Young Singers scheme where they auditioned all over the UK for kids to be and this is actually kind of unbelievable to me in an opera version for BBC um, of The Little Prince. Now The Little Prince is a story that's really special to Jim Steinman's heart oh, wow. and he sees Strat in some ways as The Little Prince and um, because again it's a story about growing up and what's important when you grow up and coming of age and it was the big turning point in my life where I realized that musical theater was going to be the thing for me because I did this opera and met some amazing people doing it, including a musical director from the UK called Tim Sutton, who said, hey, I'm starting a, a thing in Northern Ireland where professional MDs and choreographers and directors come over from the UK and we're going to do musicals in a weekend in Northern Ireland. Do you want to do it? After I did this opera. How old opera, were you at I this I was 12. Point? Wow, so that was so young. Yeah, and I moved to London for a couple of months to film this opera for the BBC, and it was wild. You can watch it somewhere, and I am the most overenthusiastic, <laughs> chubbiest little kid, and I'm having the best time of my whole life. And what I was the opera called? The Little Prince. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, and it's so funny because Jim actually gave Andrew a, like a knitted doll of The Little Prince mm -hmm. for one of our press nights with a microphone wrapped around his neck. 
Um, and <laughs> because the character of Strat yeah, at does the various that, yeah. points, yeah. Um, and the little prince was obviously um, was weirdly also a really big part of Andrew's life. Wow. Who read the story um, when he was younger, and it was like a really big thing for him as well. So, did Jim Steinman dream you guys into I, existence? I, I in, think he might have, including your entire backstories. The only version, the only thing I, I want to tweak for the fictional version of this is that I want your eight when you were eight years old, the song that everyone in Northern Ireland had to sing to be, I do anything for love, but I <laughs> yeah. won't do that. Could you imagine that? A 10 minute version by every eight year old singing every line. Gosh, no, they were, thank, thank goodness, like one minute long songs. What were they, traditional <laughs> Irish songs? Or? Do you know what? I remember the first one I ever sang really well, which like probably isn't a good thing because it means it's really imprinted on my memory. And it was this song, which was like, Grandma, Grandpa, a mouse is in the house. <laughs> and it was what? about this it was about this mouse in the house and like finding it, basically. And it's so weird that I remember that. <laughs> but obviously the first time watching, you know, like competing at that odd level is very yeah, heavily imprinted. But I've I've always remembered that song and my mom will probably listen to this and be like, Oh, that was the worst. <laughs> that is so so yeah. bizarre so to that's me. a weird kind of weird path life story but yeah then I uh, once I realized I wanted to do it I you know did as much as I could as a teenager still trained as a soprano but you know tried to do a bit of dance here and there because I was like mm, that's gonna get you know to a point where that's important yeah you can't just be a double threat yeah exactly so I mean I, there are a few but yeah and then I started training and then I went to musical theater college uh, in Guildford and then I became I've recently become a Pilates instructor so like then everything kind of like falls into line and you start building your skill level everywhere well that, yeah. all that Pilates like it shows off like you can tell you're yeah. you're doing so many it really is so acrobatic yeah there's so much jumping and <laughs> stretching and like tumbling yeah. and, and that's all my decision I like brought that upon myself you're like sorry understudies <laughs> yeah. have you ever swung out and watched the show with an understudy on I haven't done it in so long because I never go off I guess uh -huh. I've, I've done the show for song I'm very very rarely off I'm very lucky to uh, maintain well right um, well and I guess if you were not feeling well you'd need to be in bed but sometimes, yeah. sometimes but I did I did it back at the very beginning mm -hmm. every single person was given a show watch in Manchester and that was mainly because there was so much spectacle and so many screens and da, da, da. they were like we just think you need to all see what it is mm -hmm. because no one really knew if anyone was going to like it. And Andrew always talks about this moment. Um, we always like discuss it that we did the, the like a dress rehearsal in Manchester to like some invited people who were in the area, mm -hmm. like just kind of an open dress. And it was the worst. <gasps> like it was so, you know, they had no idea what was going on. And they were like, they were like, oh God. And they were just not quite on board with it. And they were like very, very quiet. And we thought everyone's going to hate it. And then he screened the first line in the first preview and the whole place went absolutely nuts. And we were like, oh, thank God, it's going to be like, and then everyone fell in love with it and they really came along on the ride with this because we had that moment of kind of terror. I think everyone was like, I, we think you need to see how wonderful this is. So Andrew and I actually were swung off together um, and we watched our understudies do it together. We that watched, must have been so weird. Yeah, we watched uh, the lovely Ruben and the lovely Georgia uh, back in Manchester. It was really odd because you think, gosh, it's really funny that someone's like mimicking the way I sort of move naturally. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you don't want someone to have to do exactly, you know, what you do. Yeah, but when you've created something, you know, there are bound to be pieces of you. Of course, yeah. Role. And they're going to really respect like the work you've put into it and stuff. So, yeah, it's really surreal watching someone else do it. And now... There's a production in Germany as well, which I haven't got to see yet, but the lovely Sarah plays Raven and does most of it in German. So but that'll be interesting. Songs, right? They're they're mostly in German, yeah. They really? have like bits of English and bits of German. It's which is yeah, it was a controversial choice, I hear. Um, well, I mean I guess Jim's it's not Jim Steinman's first uh, foray into German. Yeah, exactly. Um, what is it? What and is Tanzer Vampire. Yeah, is, I was gonna say I just know it as Dance of the Vampire. Yeah, it's still very, very, very huge in Germany. Is it still playing? Uh, it is. It's actually, it's going to be opening um, once back closes this year. Oh, wow. Yeah, in the same theater. Wow. They love their Jim Steinman. Yeah, who doesn't? I mean, I know. What, I, I just can't stop thinking about all of the different 
references and all of the stories that this reminded me of, because of course there's the Peter Pan thing. Mm -hmm. Like we know that Jim Simon wrote initially wrote or wrote a musical called Neverland. Yeah. The fact that he's collaborated with Gary Barlow, who did write a musical based on Neverland also just brings me so much joy. That's just a little sidebar. But also I was, are you familiar with Tuck Everlasting? I've heard of it, yeah, but I haven't watched it. It's a show about forever being forever young. And yeah. for them, it was like this family that drank water out of a special spring that right. made them forever young. And they were, you know, there was a 17-year-old boy who had traveled the world and done all of the things that you'd want to do in a lifetime, but he right. never really, like, found a friend, a true friend. Yeah. Um, so he sort of ventures out. Anyway, so there's some of that yeah. about what it means to be trapped as mm-hmm. a teenager forever. There's some elements of Rapunzel about the beautiful, the beautiful young girl trapped in a tower by yeah. her parents who don't want to let her experience the pain of the real world. And the uh, last job I did before Bad Out of Hell was Joanna in Sweeney Todd. Yeah, it's very so I Joanna. Had just played a girl on a balcony. Yeah, and the what is what is the. Green finch and then a yeah. bird, yeah. Um, I so can I had, imagine I had that just had that moment, like, and then I was like, "Oh, I'm coming to it in a completely different perspective, but also, yeah, same flavor, a very, and very different song choices." Yeah. But, but those archetypes of the characters are there. And then I was also thinking a lot about True Blood. Do you guys yes, have True Blood? I love True Blood <laughs> um, because really, like, you know, the big question for me was always, "What's it going to be like when she's 80? Like, exactly the, that. You know, it's one thing when the vampire is like the hot guy 10 years older, but as she continues to age and yeah. he doesn't. And does she? Well, do- right. And the important thing to me is not whether she does or she doesn't, but he genuinely believes it doesn't matter. And so are you talking about True Blood or are you talking about Strap. Bad Out of Hell? I'm talking about Bad yeah. Out of Hell, but, but that is what I always thought in True Blood as well. I was like, exact same thing. But that's like every kind of vampiric story is like, that thing of you know are you gonna are they gonna turn it i love vampires i that's that sounds so weird no it doesn't (laughs) my favorite show growing up was buffy and i want to be buffy so like i just yeah when anyone always asks me like like what's your dream role i'm like it's already happened Uh. um but anyway uh so it's not exactly like buffy the musical slash remake um and yeah it's like the exact moment and it's like i think the endearing thing and maybe the short-sighted thing about youth and love and everything it is that at that time you're like it genuinely doesn't matter to me mm-hmm. and that happens I'm you know in a lot of ways forever yeah in a lot of ways when you are 17 18 there are so many things in relationships at that age that are not right and that you would look at now and say how did I ever think that was going to work mm-hmm. but whether it's a larger than life forever young story or whether it's a real life 17 18 year old relationship you just overlook those things and you think like hormones idealistic rose tinted glasses everything is going to be fine forever well it really i mean my side passion is neurology and evolutionary biology Amazing. and it really is just a question of not just but it very much is an element of the frontal lobe not being developed like that's why you can't rent a car in the united states until you're 25 oh, years old because that. we are neurologically evolved or not evolved until we're 25 to make good decisions right. we are we as human beings are reckless when yeah. we're young and and i think that i the show left me thinking a lot about about what it means to mature because there are certain things that you know we look back and we're like oh I was so such a naive youth but it really a lot of it is our brain chemistry mm-hmm. um, and the hormones that trigger us to think about things in a certain way or react to things in a certain way but then there's wisdom that you get over time and how would wisdom of a li- of you know a hundred lifetimes while still having the recklessness of being 18, I can just imagine that being a horrible trap. Yeah, and that's when you look at Strat and the Lost and you think, you know, it's that thing Raven says of it, you know, it sounds amazing, I think it'd be great um, to have no parents and no supervision and no love and no growth, but yeah, it's like they are stuck and Strat has been, you know, 18 for quite a while, as he says. But How still, long? I want to know how long. <laughs> Some people say it's like, I, I, in my opinion, I think it's over 100 years. Well, what I, I think... will say is, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but at City Center, they're passing out something called the Obsidian, the Obsidian Times. Times yeah. 
I don't know why we don't get a playbill, but at least we get the Obsidian Times, and it has a date on it, and it says it 2030, yes, which it means does. that this is only 10 years in the future. Which means that this is also probably, most likely, definitely a parallel universe. Most likely, definitely? Yeah. Well, also, I think about it like we don't read 1984, the George Orwell book, and think like, oh, that happened 25 yeah. years ago. You exactly. Know? We read it, and we think... This is how he imagined it when he wrote it. Yeah. And when I think Jim Steinman imagined 2030 yeah. back in 1965, it wasn't the 2030 that's 10 years away. That yeah. probably will look sort of similar to, you know, pretty similar. Yeah. Although who knows? There might be we a chemical hope it, war. Yeah, we hope it's not a post-apocalyptic New York by that stage. Oh, my gosh. I mean. <laughs> who knows? It's all I can do. I'm not, I'm not going to go there, but... Of course, like I, there's part of me that really wants to talk politics with you mm -hmm. because of the whole Brexit thing yeah. and how Northern Ireland fits in and how the Falco character in Bad Out of Hell has it's New York City and there's a big tower with some yep. douchey guy's name on it and it's hard it's hard not to ignore that parallel. Yeah, I think I'll just acknowledge the parallels and and say we're preaching about love and connection in a time that actually is quite scary in many ways um, at the moment everywhere, not just the UK and the US. There's, you know, there's so much blame. Blame culture, I think, right now is supremely damaging in every way. And everyone is looking for ways to disconnect from each other and yeah. point the finger. It's othering. Yeah. And the, the ultimate symbol of othering is locking yourself away mm -hmm. and basically treating other human beings as if they're an alien race or like animals. Yeah. And we're just kind of saying to people in the most loving, entertaining way we can, hey, wouldn't it just be nicer if we all loved a little bit more? And you'll notice that Strat and the Lost, every single one of them have an equal sign, the sign of the Lost, mm -hmm. because what the Lost are believing in, in, in Obsidian, and, you know, what we all believe in is equality for all. It's that everyone is special in their own way and that everyone is completely unique. And, you know, we have a lot of, within The Lost, when you look at the back, you know, you look at the relationships. I think we're probably one of the only shows um, at the moment who have same-sex partnering. Mm -hmm. You know, that the swings, especially like in the UK, because we had such a long run, our swings were multi-gender swings. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't matter if you were going on for a male or female track. You were partnering, partnering whoever you were partnering. Mm -hmm. um, and we very much believe that, you know, we want to represent as much as we can that feeling of love and connection. And we want people to leave thinking about this music, which somehow grabs you from the gut and, you know, makes you want to feel something. And sometimes you can't put your finger on it, but you feel like you're connecting to it in a more deep and profound way and sometimes that might just be the sheer feeling of the bass through the floor it mm -hmm. might be the lyrics it's you know it might be the voices but it's all about trying to be a little bit more alive trying to like look up from your phone trying to like actually talk to people well you've got plenty to look at in this <laughs> show there's fireworks there's motorcycles yeah. there's like stage blood and acrobatics yeah. and screens and multi-tiered sets and crazy you know like hot bodies and yeah. there's so much to look <laughs> at um i actually went to the show with a friend who is hearing uh, who is hard of hearing oh wow and there were times when she like wanted to feel the music rather than hear it and mm. so she like turned down her hearing aids so that ah. she could feel she could concentrate on the feeling yeah. of the music and i think that's that's sort of what you mean it's very beautiful yeah yeah um and her dog managed not to freak out too much. She had a, she has a service animal. Oh, um, it, the dog did not like the big bangs. Yes, but, there were a couple of those. Uh, but she did pretty pretty well. I think they both enjoyed the show. Oh, good. As did I. Um, I'm so happy to have gotten to know you. I, I, is New York treating you well? Yes, I am absolutely loving it. It does remind me of London in a lot of ways. You know, it's so busy and full of life. What is not treating me well, I will just say, I don't know how you will cope with it, is the humidity. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely crazy. My hair does not look great. Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> it does today. It's just, yeah, no, that's crazy. But apart from that, I'm having the best time. You know, the theater scene's super exciting. Everyone's been very welcoming. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Are you going to shows on your days off, or does that feel too much like work? I am. I've tried to fit in a couple so far. So uh, I saw King Kong because I didn't want to miss it. 
um, because the wonderful Drew McConey, mm -hmm. um, who directed and choreographed it, I actually worked with him one of my first jobs in the UK. Uh. I did the Oklahoma UK tour with him, and so that was really fun. Who Had did you play such in Oklahoma? A good time. I covered Laurie, actually, oh, so nice. big up the understudies. Um, yeah, I covered Laurie. It was really fun. So you um, saw King Kong. So I saw Tink King Kong, and I saw Beetlejuice so far, and I've got loads more on my list, but that's what I've seen. And Beetlejuice was so much fun. I just, I had so much fun at both of them. It's really, it's so exciting uh, in New York to see how much new work there is. Yeah. It's a very, very different landscape to the UK theater scene. There is a lot of new work in the UK theater scene. The problem is, is it's not being supported. Mm. It's not funded in the same way, um, which is crazy to me because actually Broadway shows, as far as I understand, cost more to put on. Mm -hmm. um, and technically are a bigger risk um, but in the UK, the theatre audiences will more often want to go see things that um, that they know, you know, that are long runners, that are transfers from Broadway that already come with a pedigree attached to them. I mean, the fact that the mousetrap is still playing tells you something. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of long runners and, you know, they're all great, but it, it would be really nice to in the same way as here in New York to have so many things that you're like, oh, it's new, I can't wait to go see that. Yeah. As opposed to like, oh, that's been there for 20 years. That's I could interesting see it again. because I feel like there just is never enough new work. Wow. And I feel like there is there are new productions that come in every mm -hmm. year, but there are also, so many of them are based on existing properties. Yeah, and when course. the theater makers say, what can we do with this property or with this idea that can only be done on a stage, then I'm thrilled. Yeah. Um, or when a revival comes in, like the the current Oklahoma, mm. Daniel Fish's Oklahoma, that won the Tony, um, that makes me think, like, this is why you you remake something, whether yeah. it's a revival or whether it's, like, taking Beetlejuice and putting it on a stage where Alex Brightman is doing things that you could never have done on a screen. Yeah. But what I want to see more of is totally original works written for the stage yeah. and those don't get funded nearly enough yeah I, I'm trying to think recently what uh, come from away is come from away be more chill yeah um but I mean there I know there are ones that we're forgetting there are lots of plays the prom? Uh, yeah of course the prom. Thing, right yeah and that's another one that's very big on the same sex partnering yeah um not just in the leading role but in the ensemble yeah um and both be more chill and the prom are closing very soon. Yeah. Um, I know you don't have two shows on Wednesdays, so. Exactly. You've That's got midweek matinees, or I'm going to be seeing everything. Yeah, cool. Well, if I have any extra tickets, I may take you with me. Oh, I'd love that. I do, uh, I do get to go see a lot of shows, so Fun. I'll keep you posted. Uh, and the one thing that I always do at the end of every Laura Haywood Interviews episode is give you an opportunity to promote a platform that's important to you that's a nonprofit or charity doing good in the world, because um, to me, there's no excuse for having a public platform without using it to try to make the world a better place and you know we we talk about things like I'm not going to name any names but like some people who are considered the world's biggest influencers have not I I don't see a lot of evidence that they have asked themselves the question well how do I want to influence the world mm -hmm. um, instead they seem to and again I'm not I'm not really not trying to talk about anybody specifically mm -hmm. but I see a lot of how can I get paid to post a picture with a product yeah on my platform influence people to like me as right. opposed to well, and how will I, I influence if because people say to me how do you become an influencer and I said mm -hmm. don't ask yourself that until you realize the influence you want to have on the world and yeah. mine is to make the world a I mean I have I literally have a mission statement my mission in life is to spread joy through contagious enthusiasm it's so wonderful and if I can get <laughs> enthusiastic about a cause that's important to your heart because you won't just be throwing a name out you'll be like talking about something that excites you and that drives you and that will in turn drive me and hopefully that will drive all the people listening yeah and I know that nobody out there is like I mean it'd be nice to think people were writing thousand dollar checks yeah but like we can all find a dollar or five in our pocket and so you're going to tell us in a minute about your about your cause of choice, but I'm going to, I already know what it is and I'm going to make a donation in your honor oh, today. You. It won't be huge. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to make my own ends meet on this show, but I can find a few dollars every week for a good cause. And I hope that everyone listening does. I have this dream of something that I, in my brain call the Laura Haywood effect or the Laura Haywood interviews effect mm -hmm. where, um, an organization hears an interview uh, I mean, an organization is mentioned in the interview and they don't know it, yeah. but they suddenly get 
just a huge influx of <laughs> yeah. five dollar donations and they're like why do we just get ten thousand five dollar donations on the same <laughs> yeah. day so that's like my dream i love that tell me about uh the organization that you've chosen to talk about today well uh i usually would talk about something like vegan or environmentally related um because i'm quite vocally uh, vegan um but also i thought today um a cause that's close to my heart is the great ormond street hospital um, in the UK, in London, they do incredible work for children. It is a children's hospital um, in making their lives uh, just a whole lot better, not just looking after them and making sure they receive the best medical attention. Um, I actually recorded um, with a lot of UK celebrities their Christmas single, Rock with Rudolph, this year. Um, and they're just wonderful. And the most interesting thing, I actually think, which is also connected to the show, is there is a Peter Pan statue. Um, at Great Ormond Street Hospital and actually they were gifted their rights to Peter Pan so there is an amazing amazing connection with the show as well so I just went to the website which is is I love that it's it's the Great Ormond Street Hospital but that is abbreviated to gosh yeah. g-o-s-h dot so n-h-s dot u-k and right on the fr the, co the home page is a beautiful child holding a a copy of Peter Pan the fact that J.M. Barry donated the rights or gifted the rights yeah. to Peter Pan to this hospital is so like can you imagine if every great artist did that yeah now here like we keep hearing stories about people who pass away without even having made a will and yeah. it just like goes into arbitration for a million years but if we talk about the ultimate act of paying it forward yeah um so what so I want to know is is it like, does Jim Steinman, having acknowledged that this oh is based gosh, on I'm Peter Pan? I'm not sure, you know, does, I've never really thought about that. Does the Peter Pan, does the J.M. Barry estate get any cut of this? I, well, or is it just public domain? I, I don't know now, actually, because I, I remember, like, Andrew always tells this story that whenever originally Jim was writing Neverland, he sent it to the J.M. Barry estate and they said... <laughs> They said, you lost me at the part where the nuns were riding on flying motorcycles. Mm -hmm. So that was in the original. So I'm not sure. It's uh, something to look up and research. Yeah, exactly. Well, I am going to www.gosh.nhs.uk. And I'm going to make a donation in honor of you, in honor of, uh, of Bat Out of Hell and Peter Pan and J.M. Barry and the Little Prince and all the <laughs> connections throughout the years. Um, I want to remind people that they can follow you on Instagram yes. and Twitter. Uh, the Instagram is Christina, Christina Ben. Oh, yeah. Instagram no, Instagram is Christina, is Christina Bennington, Bennington um, spelled just like you think it would be. Mm -hmm. And Twitter is Christina Ben, B E N N. And then you can also on Twitter follow Bat the Musical NY and on Instagram Bat the Musical.